Hello, Laura Salguero again. Um, the title of this talk has a lot of terms in it, and I'm going to spend some time exploring what those terms are and how they apply. Uh, for now, if you don't know what they are, that's okay, because it took me a while to know what they are, too. <laughs> but the gist is, uh, we were looking at the environment, safety, and health from an enterprise level. We were applying systems engineering to an organization instead of a physical system. We were trying to analyze risk using systems engineering. So Sandia National Laboratories is a very large and complex facility. As an FFRDC, we do a lot of very diverse work. Obviously, we're very well known for managing the nuclear weapons stockpile, but we also do threats to national security, we do climate change, we do so many different types of research from biology to chemistry to physics to engineering problems. And we're also really big. We have 13,000 employees, 200,000 acres of land, over 1,000 buildings, and we operate at multiple sites. So we have our large Albuquerque site, we're in Carlsbad, we're in Nevada, we're in California, just to name a few, we also have other sites. And in every one of these sites across the world, we do work. And this is a challenge for the Environment, Safety, and Health Department. We have, um, we have a federal mandate, we have a personal mandate that we want to keep our employees and the environment safe. And we want to keep people healthy. So how do we do that with such a complex environment, with so many people, so many buildings, so many different types of work over such a broad physical distance? How can we know if our ES&H department is effective, and how can we know what risks we have? Now, one of the things, terms I put in the title was a complex adaptive organization. And that is a really heavily loaded term. And I think that if you don't just for fun on the weekends read papers about complex system management, you probably don't know what that means, but it's a controversial term. So most people in organizational management believe in the very common method of corporate America with the rigid centralized management structure. And at Sandia, we play the game a little differently. We operate more as a complex adaptive organization in that we have a lot of freedom given to the agents at the lower levels of the organization. And this introduces a lot of variability. It's very hard to predict environments like this. However, it also is one of the things that makes Sandia so innovative and so effective at solving problems. How you manage a complex adaptive organization is very different. You have to have complex and adaptive leadership. And how you manage risk in a complex adaptive organization is also very different from the standard centralized management format. So what we really wanted to do when we were trying to analyze the risk inherent in the ES&H organization for Sandia is we wanted to focus on three things that we thought we could apply systems engineering to and we could understand. And so these three, obviously there are many risk inducing characteristics for complex systems and organizations and enterprises. These were the three that we thought we could start out with, kind of get our teeth into, and really work well with. So the first one, normalization of deviance. This happens typically in organizations that are functionally aligned, or a favorite term I've heard a lot is stovepipe. So normalization of deviance is when small changes occur over time and unsafe behaviors begin to take place. So maybe one day John forgets to wear his safety glasses, so he puts on sunglasses and thinks that's okay. 
And then this happens again and again. And Stacy sees that he's just wearing his sunglasses, and she's like, well, I have glasses on. If sunglasses are good enough, I just wear glasses. And then time goes by, and it becomes a trend where people are wearing sunglasses. And then someone else says, oh, well, they're just correcting their vision. I don't need safety glasses at all. And then over time, you have a group that's participating in sometimes wildly unsafe behaviors, and they don't even recognize what they're doing, right? So it's not an intentional thing. It happens when we have structural secrecy within an organization. Organizational drift is similar, but it talks more about standards of behavior. And you'll see in the slide here, I say that slowly loosens standards. I don't love the way that sounds, even though it's kind of true. It's not a negative thing. So when you think about it from an enterprise top-down level, having varying standards for different groups is bad. It introduces risk. If your customer needs to come and interact with your safety organization and they've got a different story and a different process and a different timeline with every group they interact with, of course that introduces risk, right? Your customer will get fatigued. They won't want to deal with it. They'll find one group cumbersome and they'll avoid it and things can happen. But from the lowest level of the organization, organizational risk is often seen as a positive. They believe that it's often they believe that they're streamlining. We don't need this information, and if we ask the questions in this different way, it'll be better for us. And they take all these steps that in, in a normal, or well, normal, not really the right word, in a traditional centralized management corporate structure, you would not see that as much as you do in a complex adaptive system like Sandia, where we have a lot of freedom given to agents at the lowest level. So that was another one we wanted to really look at and see if we could use systems engineering to kind of tease those pieces out. And then the third one is probably the most obvious. If we have pinch points and information flow, if things are getting dropped, if we're not communicating properly, then of course we're introducing risk. So how, what can we do? What are the different ways we can look at that? And one of the interesting things about Sandia is that physical distance is a really big factor. We have so many different sites. Now, a lot of different environment safety and health organizations manage that in different ways. Some people, like Los Alamos model, they have embedded safety and industrial hygiene and radiation protection, for example. So a project or lab will have their embedded personnel that help them solve their problems. At Sandia, we have it centralized. So we have all the safety and IH and hazardous materials, all of these people sit together so that we have consistent standards. But we're introducing different types of risk, and it's, it's a balancing act depending on, you know, how do you want to set up your organization and what risks are most acceptable to you. So at Sandia, we have centralized ESNH, but we have a lot of physical distance between our sites, which introduces risk. So how can we study that risk? So we approach this from an enterprise architecture standpoint. And enterprise architecture is really interesting, I think. It looks at the organizational structure. It also looks at business processes. It looks at your physical structure, where you're located, you know, who are you closest to. If your safety group is in the office next door, you're a little bit more likely to go visit them than if they're in a different state. Uh, and then IT systems, which ended up playing a really big role later in the project. So we were looking through the literature to see how other people applied systems engineering to organizations. And what we found is that largely they didn't. There was a paper from 1995 and one from 2007 where people had applied IDEF zero to organizations, but there was not really an MBSC application. Now, after this project concluded in uh, June, there was a paper put out, the Royal Australian Navy applied MBSC and Genesis to how they structure the entire reorganization of the Navy, which is super cool. So we were on something. But <laughs> so we really, enterprise architecture is applying systems engineering to an enterprise. 
And we use model-based systems engineering to do this. So this is um, a basic schema, uh, entity relationship diagram from Vitech Corporation. We use the Genesis tool. Vitech makes Genesis. Uh, we chose to do Genesis because we have a lot of corporate support for it at Sandia already. It's a very easy tool to get into and get running with. I was familiar with Genesis already. So it was a good choice for us. We wanted to use model-based systems engineering specifically because the visualization, especially when you're communicating with people who are not systems engineers and when you're communicating with a diverse group of people, the visualizations can really help communicate complexity and interaction. And that was one of our goals in trying to understand risk in our system here. So, on a basic level, I'm sure most of you already know what model-based engineering is. But on, on a basic level, there's really four main pieces to model-based engineering. You have your requirements architecture, which influences your functional architecture, which influences your physical architecture, which influences your test architecture. And as all of these pieces are turning and developing, they're turning and developing each other. If we discover that we have components that we can't use for some reason that might affect our functions or our requirements, or our ability to test and verify our requirements. So even though model-based systems engineering is traditionally applied to physical systems, what we wanted to do was abstract it into applying it to an organization. What does that mean? Abstract. So we don't have, when you have an organization, you don't have like a physical architecture of a rocket where there's a piece here and a piece there, it's all connected together and it does these things. So we wanted to be able to apply this to people, right? And Like a hierarchy in the organization, like, for example. That's right. Or groups or sure. functional groups. Yeah. Like, so right here. Okay. So what we did was we created the organization, uh, the organizations were a kind of a higher level, right? Like we have ESNH overall, and then there's groups within ESNH. Right. And then there's departments. And what was interesting is going down to the layer of the program area. Now, everybody at San Diego can look up and see what the departments are. But as far as understanding what the programs are and what actual work being done within the department, this project was the first time all of that information was compiled into a single place. So that was really exciting. So we have the uh, program areas are assigned to the departments, right? They're located within them, their teams, and sometimes they're not just within the department, right? They might utilize oh, yeah staff from many different departments. So we we place the program areas where the leads were and who has main ownership for a program. And then we attach the IT tools because again a main part of understanding how programs and how groups interact with one another is looking at the IT tools are part of what an enterprise architecture is and we communicate digitally. So uh, we follow the DoDAF architecture development framework the DODAF Department of Defense Architectural Framework to pursue our MBIC structure. And, you know, we went through the steps. We talked about the intended use, which we've all discussed. The scope, we limited it to just Albuquerque. Again, Sandia is big and Sandia is complex. We could have included California also. We chose to bite off a smaller piece so we could see what kind of benefit we could get. Uh, as far as collecting the data, this was a laborious process that Sue and I engaged in. We met with um, senior managers and managers of every organization. We met with senior level staff of every organization. Um, we had to compile a lot of data that was not compiled into one place before now. And this is what it looks like. And it's intentionally Don't feel bad if you can't read it. That is your mock. Yes. So this is from the mock. And this is 
a spider diagram. And the main blue box in the middle is ESNH. These are the three groups that ESNH is divided into. These slate colored boxes are the orgs. Um, and if you go to Sandia's website, then that depth of information is easy to find. Finding the next layer down is the challenging part that Sue and I spent a um, very large amount of time teasing out. So these white boxes with the blue outlines, these represent the programs that these different orgs are really running. And, and to a large extent, kind of their mission areas and what they're trying to achieve. The yellow boxes are the IT tools. So we did not go as deep as we could have. Obviously, there are more connections beneath this. There are vital connections beneath this, like how, how the different departments communicate with one another. And this is, that would be a further, this is a future work for this project that would definitely help define some of this more clearly as far as determining risk. We started here to get an idea of, do we even need to go down that far? And the answer was probably yes. So this picture indicates that the functional groups, at least from what I can discern from the picture, looks like they're all operating independently. It's one of those clusters mm -hmm. that is their own little entity. They may share tools because of corporate edicts. I mean, that doesn't mean they're sharing information. That's what that picture looks like to me. Is that so that is one of the things we discovered. We thought that we're going to find a ton of IT tools that everybody uses. Now, we're not including the corporate basics. Microsoft is not in here. Adobe is not in here. We mean, you know, things under that, more specialized tools. And we thought there would be a lot of overlap. If we go to the next diagram, no, we'll talk about that over here. Um, actually, a uh, uh, comment. Um, there's... Um, Sandy is a little strange in that we have this dichotomy between line, line organizations and program organizations. And you guys were focused on trying to tease out the programmatic, you know, uh, relationships, right? Mm -hmm. But I know from my experience that in centers, which is the line, there are ES and H um, professionals. You know, there's usually one per center, but that's the line. That's not program. Mm -hmm. So did you find that nuance? I'm sure. So Sandia is structured so that we have all of our ESNH in one place. And the original intention of the ESNH professionals embedded in the line were that they were coordinators. They were yes, supposed they're, to have, they're called coordinators. Mm -hmm. They're supposed that's to have true. a depth of knowledge of ESNH and help the line interact mm -hmm. with ESNH. Because ESNH is big. There's a lot of things going on, right? Mm -hmm. There's radiation protection and there's industrial hygiene and there's safety. And then safety is not safety is the one with the most white. Where's safety? I think this is safety right here. One of the two layers. Safety oh. has so many programs going on, and they're all critical, right? It's pressure safety, electrical safety, lockout, tagout, firearm safety, aviation safety. And there's so many different pieces that when people are doing work and they need to know how to perform work safely, that's a hard question to answer. And, and it's hard to even find who to talk to. And so, again, one of the motivations for this project was how can we improve that interface? Because one of the problems with organizational drift is if the pressure safety program streamlines their program so that they get all the information they need perfectly and succinctly and in a short time frame, that may unintentionally be causing a problem for the customer who's interacting with industrial hygiene or rad protection. So having this all in one place to understand a broader view of the system as a whole that's one of the valuable pieces that it is brought. Speaking as a non-Sandian, what does ES and H mean? Environment, safety, and health. Thank you. So, one of the ways we wanted to look for normalization of deviance is to look for a strong functional alignment. 
And we thought we would do this by doing a social network analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not real data. This is a visualization. Um, but it is super cool. And <laughs> I just want everybody listening to understand that I think this is going to be a new trend in the MBSD. I'm calling it now. You heard it here. <laughs> Come on now. Invest now. <laughs> One of the neat things, so an extension of this program, I've been working with Stu to continue this work. And one of the places we applied the social network analysis is to requirements to see which are the requirements that are touching the most pieces of a project. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is it's not what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. And with NBSC, you can, I mean, all the information is in there, right? We have all the links. We have all the pieces and everything's touching. But pulling out just a, a density, just a massive data dump and looking like, which are my darkest nodes that are most connected, that's hard to do in NBSC. And so coupling it with a social network analysis has revealed interesting information. What what did you look at? Outlook or media? You know what? So here, what we were looking at was in this particular one. This was just the number of IT tools for each program. So if you look, the darkest ones have the most IT tools, and then these real light whitish gray ones have one or zero IT tools. No, can, can, you, so, can you back up? So what, what do you count as an IT tool? I so uh, IT tools are anything on a computer that you require to do your work. And that goes anywhere from like uh, Open Range, which is an industrial hygiene tool that tracks uh, exposure assessments, for example, to an access database. Okay. But whatever a program uses that is essential that we have IT support supporting and keeping on track, whatever we need a life cycle IT management approach for, that was considered an IT tool. Okay. So including engineering analysis. Like and MathCAD, right? MathCAD, MathLab, anything That's that right. would be there. But, any, but also any database, like you're saying, any database, a database or database tool? A database tool. So okay. that introduced an interesting problem because yeah. not everybody uses databases. And it's one of the things that came up that we discovered through this process is that everybody does it differently. Correct, yeah. <laughs> we had groups that printed things. Yes. We kept printed copies. Yes. We're big tree killers. <laughs> <laughs> we had groups that had like this amazing, robust data configuration set up and it was easy to find everything. And then we had everything in between. And again, if we go back to the risk-inducing characteristics, obviously we found some, right? Because that is a variation in standard, which from a corporate top-down level, that introduces risk. If we have audits, if we need to access information quickly, that's a problem. We were not aware of that risk before this process. So that's another benefit. So, so each node, each dot here represents what exactly again? I bet so you... each dot is a program. A program. That's right. Okay. So and the, how dark the dot is, that represents how many IT tools are connected to it. Right. So there are other ways it could be applied. I think super cool social network analysis is totally going to be a thing for MBSC. And what are the connecting lines? What are the connecting lines then? Sorry. So those are how they are set up within an org. So if they're in the same org, they're connected? Okay. And so there's a lot of different ways. Programmatic or line? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know too much. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so when we were looking at organizational drift, we wanted to look at IT tools. And the reason we wanted to look at IT tools is because, again, I'm sure you've forgotten, these are a lot of big terms. Organizational drift is when we have a loosening of standards. From the bottom, they're streamlining their processes. But from the top, they're making it complicated and hard for the customer to deal with the needs. We were sure, this is the one that was kind of an answer to your earlier question, Bob. We were sure. They, they were all going to be connected. So the center of each petal is an org. And then all around the edges, all these other boxes on the petal, are the IT tools. And if you look carefully, 
you'll see that there is a single tool that's used by more than one org. Yes. There's only one. So why is that? That's a good question. It needs to be looked into deeper. There could be many reasons. For radiation protection, for example, they have a lot of specialized calculation tools that they use, which of course they would have a lot of tools that are dedicated to them. But Open Range is an interesting one. Shortly after we stopped this project, these two groups, this is uh, industrial hygiene and safety engineering. Shortly after the project ended, safety engineering stopped using Open Range. Yeah, the only link was broken. <laughs> But what was interesting is, once again, this is safety engineering trying to streamline their processes. Yes. They yes. found yes. that they had another way that they thought would be much better for what they do that's more unique to what they do, and they wanted to discontinue open range. The advantage of open range is it would have been consistency across the lab. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the push and pull in complex adaptive organization management. You know, what is really better? I, I don't have an answer to what's actually better. If having separate programs helps safety engineering and IH work better and keep our people safer, mm -hmm. that's better. Mm -hmm. But if having separate tools makes it harder for the customer to interact with them and makes it less likely for them to interact with them, then it's not better. So we weren't trying to answer those questions. We were trying to find areas of interest that warrant a deeper investigation. Right, and this would suggest that there's no there's no cost function associated with the interlinks, right? There's no benefit that would, would cause those to generate and maintain, right? It's like even even this one that was there went away mm -hmm. when your study was over. So there's something that's driving driving that. In other words, whatever the function is that drives the groups, they're driving to separation. That's right, and yeah. and so again, this is one of the interesting things about Sandia really is that there is so much freedom at the lower levels of the organization. People at Sandia can make decisions and they can influence the orgs around them and they can influence upper management with their decisions. One example of that is the PHS, which is the software we're going to talk about next, I think. We're going to time after this. Yeah, we're talking about it now. So the PHS is the primary hazard screen. The work planning controls organization built the PHS and it was originally intended to be one-stop shopping. You come in, you answer the questions, depending on how you answer, it'll go through, it'll tell you what your requirements are, it'll tell you what training you need, it'll even send out a beginning contact to people in ESNH to streamline the process for the customer. Now, You'll find a lot of people dislike the PHS at Sandia. They find it laborious and challenging to use. You'll find a lot of people yes and each are not big fans of the PHS also. So what we wanted to do here is we built an EFSBD, Enhanced Functional Flow Block Diagram, looking at the, one of the question sets for the PHS. This is a massive number of total questions. So we just pulled out one piece, and we looked at what are the questions asked, what are the consequences. So for example, if there is a question of do you have chemicals in the lab, and if the answer is yes, then you have to go through the chemical hazard questionnaire. And they'll ask if you're using a certain amount of a certain chemical, and you might say yes, and then there's a requirement if you're using more than that, you have to have an exposure assessment. So the next question might be, have you had an exposure assessment? And if you answer no, then it'll reach out to industrial hygiene for an exposure assessment. And then it'll let you know at the end, you know, you need an exposure assessment for this. So what would be super cool in the future, like I said, we only did the chemical hazards for this at this time. It would be really useful to fully flesh out all of the questions that's what we found, because this is complicated, right? There's a lot of pieces to this. What we found is that some of the questions were circular, some of the questions were repeated. And these were probably the reasons why the line didn't love filling it out. It wasn't a party. So there are ways that we could take this information and we could streamline it from the corporate down level instead of from the bottom up, which is how Sandia does everything right now. We could restructure how people are contacted. And an interesting question that could be answered from this type of diagram is what kind of time are we spending on this? 
right? If we have so many chemical hazards and so many radiation hazards, you know, which groups are being reached out to the most and, and which ones are critical at which point of doing work, right? Because when you're in the very beginning planning stages of work, it's very different from running into bumps halfway down the road. And so how can we structure support for our mission areas to help them be as effective as they can be? So some of the things that took away immediately was obviously the visual representation. When you're talking about complexity and when you're talking about so many different types of safety and environment, it really helps to have it all written down in one place. They still have these diagrams up on the walls in their offices, which is super cool. <laughs> um, and it's very easy to talk to people who are not systems engineers about how these projects are connected if we have them on a diagram. That very first diagram I showed with the big flower shapes, being able to see that there even is a program, you know, there are groups that didn't realize what some of the programs we even had in safety work, right? Because it's complicated and because it's not well recorded right now. And so that was a fabulous opportunity that we could kind of show that information in a different way and we could <coughs> help make senior management more aware of just how big and complex the system is. And the active dialogue was fantastic. There was a lot of pushback at first, there was a lot of hesitance <coughs> to get involved, you know, because we had to come and talk to people, and we wanted to see their stuff, and they didn't want to talk with the But then when we showed them what we were doing, it seemed like we got a lot of engagement and we got a lot of excitement. And a lot of people said, this is the first time this has been done. Mm -hmm. And they, they came to meetings to talk about it, and they wanted to put input in. And one of the really great things is normally when you say, we want to restructure our organization, everyone's very upset, they're annoyed, they don't want to be a part of that. But approaching it this way with the diagrams and with the systems engineering mindset had the opposite reaction. People were excited about what we were doing. And that was really valuable. And in particular, the IT tool repository having all the IT tools in one place and having showing which programs are using them and what they're being used for has been very valuable for our IT management group. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes with turnover, they're just a tool is dumped in their lap, here you manage this now, and they don't necessarily know what it does or how it's applied. And so this was really valuable for them to see what is being done with it. And again, look for overlap. You know, do we have two different groups using two different tools that do the same thing? And, you know, are they aware that it's the same thing? Are there advantages to consolidating to one? One of the really exciting things about this is I think that we really did show that we can apply systems engineering to a system that's not classically developed with systems engineering. Uh, we showed a lot of interfaces, uh, we had a lot of opportunities to look for uh, different needs. We found actual problems, which was exciting, because we were able to identify just where some of these issues were, and we were able to help them get a start on, on how to fix it, or even whether it needed fixed, because again, Keep coming back to this. In a complex adaptive organization, sometimes it's not necessarily the best to have it all the same way. There are advantages to everything being different. And innovation and the drive and the ability to do their own creative thinking for organizations, that's a benefit to getting work done well. But it's it's a game of just managing the risk, understanding where the risk is, and doing what we can to mitigate the risk. So I think that we did what we set out to do. We had a lot of success with the project. Um, 
for future work, we've taken it, instead of from the whole ES and H and Sandia level, we've, Sue and I have drilled down into her program, and we're looking at taking these, this information that, and these concepts and these processes that we discovered with this and applying it to one program within one org, just a smaller piece, which, as I'm sure you're aware, that's turned into like a huge monster of its own. And we're looking at really developing a requirements architecture and linking it all in. So oh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. We don't want to work also ES and H focused. Um, so this particular program, it, it, it has a lot of ES and H mm -hmm. to it. I mean, and it's, we take environmental samples, so there's um, activity level work that requires all kinds of this ES and H thing. So one of the early things I could show well, um, with Laura's help was, you know, here's this activity that I do. Yeah. Sampling a well, sampling well for groundwater. These are the 35 trainings <laughs> that spit out from all of the ESNH requirements, corporate mm -hmm. requirements, environmental <laughs> permit requirements for someone to fill a bottle mm -hmm. with beautiful water. Our groundwater is lovely here. It's great. So, um, and just to show that, like to ESNH, and show them, okay, these are these are the things that we have to do because what corporate says, these are the things that we have to do because of what the state of New Mexico says, and for them to just see it and, and like see yeah. these diagrams and understand the relationships. Yeah, yeah. and say, hey, look, this is what you're doing to your technologist. 35 trainings. <laughs> so. Well, and the social network analysis. Oh, when we applied yeah. that. That was that For was, the ES of H2. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, finding that this training is required by 37 documents. Right? If, if they've left on this one training, they can't they can hardly do anything. That's right. Yeah. They, they have to sit out from almost every activity. Yeah. But also verification of program, right? Mm -hmm. So we can show that we're performing all these tasks, which is traced to all of these requirements, okay. and yeah. we have verification that we're doing what we need to be doing. Yeah. If this, if this particular requirements document expires, then it breaks all of these. Mm -hmm. Other things, mm -hmm. you know, like that. Like, this is the one that has mm -hmm. the notes with the most outgoing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was really, that was really, really fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It also verified how we grouped our technologists around certain activities because um, the nodes would clump. Mm -hmm. Like That's right. the groundwater nodes were all sort of clumped together. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, we have a team specifically for groundwater, and then. The, just the inspect the site guys who just go and, and do the head nod every year. They're, you know, they're separate. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, they, they have different right. And so no, yeah, we're not going to really have this guy, and we're not going to make mm -hmm. the guy who just looks at the site once a year go to groundwater to, and take 35 trainings. Just, you know, it just gives you. And that's a, and a the lot of where it brought the clustering out for us. Mm -hmm. So we put it, you know, we put the information into the tool, and the tool percolated out these bubbles for us, which can so cool. simplify <laughs> how to apply training. I can verify the super cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it helps that you can pick your own colors. So yeah. we have I know. watermelon, it's we have daisy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. Yeah. <laughs> So that was it. Does anybody have any questions?